So it's my great pleasure to introduce today the speaker of today, Mika Murray. So I tried to resume his CV on this kind of small paper. I did not manage. There's too much. So I had to come with my computer instead. Because really, literally, it's the kind of CV when you receive it, you cannot help yourself to feel a little bit uh, like what I am doing with my time while this person, like they work really, uh, it's quite impressive. So Mika received his um, master degree uh, in John Hopkins. Uh, no, it's big bachelor degree in John Hopkins, then moved to um, New York and to, uh, no here, Albert Einstein College of Medicine, where he did his master and his PhD there. Then moved for his uh, postdoc in Lausanne. And actually, so moved there in 2001. And after like only two years of uh, being a postdoc, got a position, which is basically it never happens. Uh, not to discourage you, right? But. Uh, <laughs> So got a position two years after and actually became like a lab director for the neuropsychology division and the radiology unit. One year after get tenured, which also never happened. <laughs> so uh, it's quite impressive. Then he became the director of the uh, EEG brain mapping core in uh, CHUF. So it's probably Centre Hospitalier Universitaire Vaudois. Wow. Uh, and yeah, went on to develop his career in the University of Lausanne, but also hold an adjunct, associ uh, adjunct associate professor position in Vanderbilt University, Nashville. Uh, is also associate professor at the Faculty of Biology and Medicine in Lausanne, adjunct professor at the Department of Ophthalmology, also at the University of Lausanne. Uh, he received several awards. Basically, I cannot name all of them. We don't have the time. Just like, just mention a few young investigator award at the Faculty of Biology and Medicine in Lausanne. In 2008, 2011, again, another young investigator award from the Swiss Society of Biological Psychiatry. 2013, a research prize from the Swiss Brain League. I will not mention is babiometric. Just go on the web and you will see that they are impressive also. So Mika actually is a leading expert in obviously cognitive neuroscience. I can just mention that he's an expert in, let's say, electrophysiology, recording scalp electrophysiology in humans. And in terms of topic, probably is one of the pioneer in research in multisensory integration and basically was leading the field into this paradigm switch about like resyncing primary sensory cortices and the way they are uh, somehow separated from associative region actually was proposing that maybe more multisensory operation would happen in this region and he was really one of the few leading this very productive line of research after that. So without saying anything else, please join me in welcoming Mika. Well, now I'm thoroughly embarrassed, so that's a good way to start. Um, I hope you're all wearing orange. I've been instructed that today is the um, day to defend uh, women and violence against them, so I would encourage everyone to be thinking about that a little bit. Ciao, Carlo. Um, it's a particular pleasure. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, you'll understand in a moment, uh, it's, it's a real pleasure for me to come back here because uh, I get to see a number of, of friends and colleagues that I've had the privilege of knowing and in some occasions working with uh, over the years. And so it's, it's kind of almost like a homecoming. And the people here that many of you either get to work with as colleagues or as uh, advisors are some of the most exceptional individuals, both scientifically and personally, uh, that you'll find. So you're very, very fortunate. And I consider myself very fortunate as well uh, to come here regularly and, and see dear friends and colleagues. So um, Olivier tried to embarrass me. He did a very good job. Uh, but 
the work that I do is, is really not only my work, but really the work of a huge number of people, uh, and I get to be their spokesmodel, so to speak, uh, although they could probably do a better job picking a person uh, with more hair. So uh, there are a few people in the lab, but also a few people uh, internationally who, who really do a lot of the work behind the work that I'll try and summarize today. Ah, yeah, the wife is at the beginning here. So she is a, a, a painter. Uh, so Francesco and I share a great passion for uh, combining art and neuroscience. And my dear wife is, is a painter. She actually just got invited to the Venice uh, Biennial uh, next year. So if you happen to hang out in Venice, which isn't so far, you can check out some of her work. Right, that's a good reminder though, Carla. Uh, so I, I am actually a New Yorker and I've lived in Europe long enough to slow myself down when I speak. Uh, but if I'm not slow enough, scream or shout. I also mumble. Uh, and if you don't know what that means, then your English isn't quite American yet. If you do know what that means, good job. Uh, and that's a subway map of New York City. And it's, it's there to, to remind me of home. Uh, and it's there today to remind us about this, this topic that Olivier talked about, which is who's talking to whom, when, and where in the brain, and to say what. And that's kind of the theme of, of my research, uh, I think, since the beginning, which is the, the dynamics of the brain and how that influences information processing. And as Olivier nicely introduced, what we've tried to do over the years is investigate how the different senses talk to each other. And I'm not the only one in the room who has been a pioneer of this. Uh, Max and Francesco have certainly been there alongside and often ahead of me, and I've kind of followed in a number of, of their footsteps. Uh, so I shouldn't take too much credit at all. Uh, it's, it's really been a, a large number of people kind of beating the same drum. Uh, anyway, so you can take a textbook image of the senses, and you'll see something like this that says there's visual cortex, auditory cortex, and somatosensory cortex. I apologize for excluding the chemical senses. They do exist. Uh, you're Italian, or some of you are Italian, so you know all about gustation uh, and olfaction. So prototypical textbooks will tell you that the primary senses don't communicate directly with each other because the fibers simply aren't there. And that model has been the dogma and has been the textbook image uh, for a long time. And that radically changed when uh, new techniques for retrograde tracing and anterograde tracing demonstrated monosynaptic projections between primary cortices. So you have, if, if you will, a new subway system and a new map of the brain that says, wait a minute, the senses can talk to each other as perception is unfolding. And if that's the case, then we need to rethink our basic understanding of how perception perceives, uh, proceeds. Excuse me. And recently, we've tried to, to tackle this again. This is another artwork by my good wife. Uh, she likes to get on covers of scientific journals somehow. Um, where we, we tried to also combine it with a view of how multisensory processing might change across the lifespan. And the basic, if you will, framework that we're trying to suggest is that in addition to canonical principles of uh, spatial correspondence, temporal coincidence, and inverse effectiveness, we also have to think about how these are changing across the lifespan along with learned associations. So as you learn what goes with what, and as you get statistics from your environment, how does that change the way that you integrate information? And this can change back and forth as you learn and unlearn things, as you develop uh, and as you confront new statistics in your environment. And that can be changed due to sensory loss, that can be changed due to uh, impairments of other sorts. So you can take many, many different examples of this. Uh, for example, as you learn temporal structure in your environment, as you uh, narrow your perceptual windows of what you will tolerate being put together, even as you learn, even as you learn more highly associated things like semantics or even in the case of visual uh, impairments and blindness. Again, I, I don't want to go into the details of this as much as, as highlight that the principles of information processing between the senses are, are getting more and more complex. And I, it is a burgeoning domain where uh, there's a lot of research needed. So uh, don't, don't uh, walk away thinking all the work has been done. There's much, much more to be 
to be done. So I'll skip this in, in the interest of moving forward. So what do I want to tell you about today? So I'm going to try and convince you that this new model of brain organization indeed exists, that the primary cortices are indeed loci of convergence and integration, and we can demonstrate this in humans, that this impacts our behavior and our perception, that we can change the excitability of cortex, that we can indeed use multisensory processes as a scaffold for things like sensory substitution, for things like memory, and we can tie together processes across the lifespan. So it's an awful lot of data. I'm going to throw a lot of information at you, but don't panic. You don't have to walk away with too much to take home. So how, how on earth do we demonstrate that there's convergence and integration in primary cortices? Well, behavior is a good measure. Um, I, I'm a neuroscientist, but I'm also an experimental psychologist, which means I like measuring what people do. Uh, and a good way to do that is just ask them to press a button when they detect something. Uh, so some of the people in the room have been pioneers of this. Uh, actually, I was just reminiscing how Carlo and I very much started in, in very similar uh, research topics uh, in terms of redundant signal processing in, in vision. Uh, and you can also do the same thing in multisensory processing, where you can show that reaction times are facilitated when you have two sources of information, auditory and visual, versus either alone. And then you can combine this with techniques like functional magnetic resonance imaging. And when you do, you typically get a signal every TR. Every TR is, is how long, sorry, I, I, I know there are real experts in the room, but I also know there are students in the room. So I'll try and target what I say more to the students, because that's probably fair. Uh, for those that are more senior, if I say stupid things, you can harass me afterwards. So typically, you, you get an image of the brain every TR. You get a dot every, every time the scanner finishes collecting a series of images. And if you want to look at multisensory processing, this might not be an ideal way to do it, because if you're looking for amplitude changes in this hemodynamic response, what you don't know is if a voxel contains multisensory neurons or two subpopulations of unisensory neurons. And we said, all right, how do we get around this? We want to use fMRI, but we can't look in this direction. Well, what if we could look in the temporal domain? Well, at the time, we couldn't in an easy way because the TR was slow. So what we said is, all right, what if we jitter the stimulus with respect to when we take the, the image acquisitions? So what if we just keep repeating the stimuli and take the picture, if you will, of the brain at very different times, almost like a, a, a video camera taking pictures at different moments in time and you simply start the video camera at different points. And you can fill in the dots this way. And if you do it enough, you actually can start looking in the temporal domain instead of in the amplitude domain. And if you see changes in peak latency of the response or slope of the response, you can infer that you indeed have integration happening in that voxel. And that's precisely what we did. And what we found were a couple of interesting things. Let's see if I can manage this. The first thing is if you look within auditory cortices, primary auditory cortices in, in both hemispheres, but here just on the left, what you find is uh, in red an auditory response, but in blue a visual response. And it's significantly smaller, but still non-zero. And what that indicates is convergence. There are voxels responsive to light. And same thing in visual cortices. Here I'm showing it on the right. But again, it's quite bilateral. What you again find is that a visual response is stronger than an auditory response, but the auditory response is non-zero, so convergence again. The most interesting thing, however, is the black trace, the multisensory response, which has an earlier peak and a steeper slope than either unisensory response alone, indicating integration happening within these primary cortices. And this was a whole brain analysis. We didn't see any other loci demonstrating these changes in peak latency and slope. Since this time, uh, it seems very recently, but in fact, it's almost a decade ago, we've now developed techniques where you can acquire images with a TR of 200 milliseconds, whole brain coverage, which allows you now to really look at the dynamics of the bold response, and we replicated our original find. So that's one technique. Another technique to demonstrate convergence and integration is electrophysiology. So here what we did was a paradigm requiring people to either press a button when something seemed like it was moving, 
either visual or auditory, or don't press a button when something was stationary. And the advantage of this, and this uh, will be for more aficionados, is that if you have a motor response and you're comparing using an additive model, the multisensor response has one motor response, and the visual response has one motor response, and the uh, auditory stimulus has another motor response. So you'll be comparing, if you will, two motor responses to one. And so, of course, you'll have nonlinearity because you're comparing two to one. If you take the trials when there's no required motor output, you get rid of that conflict. And that's exactly what we did. And we looked for nonlinearity in the event-related potential. And what we found was that starting at 50 milliseconds, there is indeed nonlinearity in the system. And you can look as well, sorry, topographically, if you look at the maps of the response to the multisensory pair, the summed responses to the unisensory con constituents, what you find is these topographies aren't the same. And we know from biophysical principles if the topography changes, the configuration of the sources in the brain have to change. Now, they can be the same sources with different orientations or with different uh, amplitudes of response intracranially, but this will lead to a topographic change. And we know that then we have a change in the configuration in the brain, something special about multisensory processing. So we can conclude that. We can also conclude that these are sub-additive effects. So you can look not at a single electrode, but at global measures of the electric field strength. Moreover, we can apply linear distributed inverse solutions, which we've developed along with our colleagues in Switzerland. And what we find, again, are primary cortices, both visual and auditory, showing nonlinear responses to multisensory stimuli. Moreover, under multisensory conditions, these brain regions seem to be functionally coupled. Their activity is correlated with each other, but only under multisensory, but not unisensory conditions. So these are two techniques that we can use to demonstrate that convergence and integration is happening, but does this have anything to do with behavior and perception? One technique, again, is to take psychophysics and combine it with single pulse TMS. And they're actual experts in the room about TMS. Uh, I'm not one of them, but I enjoy using TMS as a technique to probe the involvement in a more causal manner of a given region or set of regions in a given perceptual function. So we can combine a simple detection task with single pulse TMS over the occipital pole. And what you find is what others have found numerous times since the late 80s that over a prescribed time window, usually from about 60 to 120 milliseconds or so, reaction times will be slowed down if you compare, uh, combine excuse me, an external visual stimulus with a single pulse of TMS over the back of the head. If you give an auditory stimulus, you can actually facilitate reaction times. And interestingly, over the same time window, so the TMS pulse has to delay the auditory stimulus, again, by 60 to about 120 milliseconds. If you give a combined multisensory stimulus, you effectively get an annulation, uh, cancellation, sorry. My English is sometimes turned into French. I don't know if this has happened to others in the room. Uh, I've lived abroad long enough now, my English is severely impaired sometimes. Anyway, if you give a multisensory external stimulus with a single pulse of TMS over the back of the head, you get a cancellation effect on behavior. Quite interestingly, the benefit that one observes on reaction time with real stimuli, um, auditory and visual stimulus in the environment, and compare that to the benefit on reaction time of combining an auditory stimulus with a TMS pulse, these two benefits are highly correlated. So it seems that whatever we're emulating when we apply TMS to the back of the head and combine it with an auditory stimulus emulates what might be happening when you give a real multisensory stimulus in the environment. We then also wanted to look at these conditions when you are making a motor response. And here, the stimuli were dynamically moving or, or perceived to be moving at you or away from you, so looming or receding. And what we again observed are nonlinear neural response interactions at the level of the event-related potential. And what we found is that the nonlinearity seemed to be specific to when stimuli were auditory and visual and both coming at you, a multisensory looming stimulus. We did not see the same nonlinearities, at least over this early time window of about 70 to 113 milliseconds, for other combinations, either two stimuli receding or one looming, one receding, and so on and so forth. What we observed behaviorally 
was also that reaction times were facilitated for all multisensory conditions, but even more so for multisensory looming stimuli. If you look at the relationship between the percentage gain on reaction time and the percentage gain in terms of nonlinearity of brain responses, we find that there's a, a linear relationship, quite reliable one, only for the case of multisensory looming stimuli. So whatever integrative process is happening at this early latency seems to be linked to how fast you will be to respond to the stimuli. So we can take this further and, and push the question of how do, you, how do you explain this facilitation of perception and behavior? So again, we went back to TMS as a, as a more causal technique, and, and together with Vincenzo Rome and Gregor Tutz, we looked at changes in the excitability of visual cortex as revealed by phosphine perception. So what we did is for every individual participant, we determined their phosphine threshold, and then we turned down the amplitude of the TMS output to about 85% of that threshold. And what that means is that in the presence of a TMS pulse alone, people report phosphines about 27% of the time. And now what we did is we added a pure tone on some trials. And what, people, what we observed is that people started reporting phosphines more and more, depending, again, on a specific delay between the sound and the TMS pulse, which follows an alpha oscillation. Gregor and, and Vincenzo have, have followed this up much more extensively than I have, uh, but it indeed does follow uh, an alpha oscillation. So what we found is that sounds can increase the excitability, or seem to increase, the excitability of visual cortex. We pursued this a bit further to ask, well, do all sounds do this? And what might be the sources of this auditory input onto visual cortex? And how do we do that non-invasively in humans? One way was to look at the dependence on, on bandwidth and frequency of the sounds. So we first looked at the center frequency. And what we found is that higher frequency sounds seem to give the highest change in excitability of visual cortex, even though they're perceived as equally loud. Likewise, narrowband sounds seem to give the highest impact on changing visual cortex excitability compared to broadband sounds. And again, we also looked at the timing of this, such that the delay, the biggest enhancement of excitability is with the shortest delay and then gradually decreases. So these three aspects together seem to suggest a very low level auditory input into visual cortex. We then also looked at a more ethologically relevant stimuli, again, these looming sounds. So I don't know if they'll play properly, but a, loom whoops. a looming sound should sound like this, getting louder over time. Uh, stationary just has the same volume over time, and so on and so forth. What we found was that all sounds in general increase excitability of visual cortex, but looming sounds do so even more so. In fact, they nearly doubled the excitability, as measured again by phosphine perception, of visual cortex. If you take the same amplitude uh, profile, that is the same envelope over time, but in this case, instead of using a tone, you use a white noise, we did not see this looming specific effect. So it seems to suggest that there's something about either the, the structure of the sound or the structure of the sound being informative about what might be a real object uh, and something learned about what is, what is likely to be a dangerous thing in my environment. More interesting was to look at the dynamics of this. So what we did is we applied TMS after every 10 milliseconds and had a lot of trials and very patient participants. And what we could do from this is ask two questions. One, when does the visual cortex know, uh, and that's an, uh, know in, in an anthropomorphic sense, uh, that the sound is looming versus stationary? And when do our participants report a sound is looming versus stationary? So you get a, a psychometric function, and if you will, a neurometric function of discrimination between looming and stationary sounds. And what we found was that the center for the psychometric function was about 115 milliseconds across our participants, whereas the center of this function for the visual cortex was at 80 milliseconds, 35 milliseconds earlier. And you can look at this curve for every single participant. And what we found is that the longer you take as a participant 
to differentiate between looming and stationary sounds, the longer your visual cortex will take. And it was quite a reliable correlation. Then we asked, all right, well, that's cute. It's not very often that you'll have just a looming sound in your environment, but it's more often the case that you'll have annoying sounds in your environment. And if you've ever lived in New York City, you might have a faucet that drips. And if you live in Italy, you certainly have mosquitoes. So is it the case that all sounds in your environment will increase the excitability of your visual cortex? Or is it dependent on the predictability of space? So what Steve Hilliard and others have shown is that a sound lateralized in space will presumably, according to them, automatically activate visual cortex in the contralateral hemisphere. And we asked whether this was indeed the case for all sounds. So we had two situations. One situation, if you will, where the sound was improbable in space with equal probability left and right. And another situation where 80% of the time the sound was on, let's say, the left, or 80% on the right, and 20% on the other side. So a much more predictable situation, if you will, of faucet dripping. And what we found is that the, the activation of contralateral visual cortex was only when you had unpredictability in your environment. If you had predictability, sorry, if it's unpredictable and therefore spatially irregular, you would have this activation of visual cortex. You need the visual cortex to help you figure out space. But if it was regular, you don't need the visual cortex. It doesn't add anything more. So it doesn't seem to be an automatic and pre-attentive process, at least in our hands. Um, and again, we've, we localized it to the same regions that, that others have seen within um, BA18. <coughs> Excuse me. So what about sensory substitution? Well, uh, as Olivier knows, blindness is a big problem. And it affects a large number of people in the world, the majority of whom are in developing countries. Uh, and the majority of whom are older uh, individuals above age 50. Some interesting statistics uh, that I didn't know about until a few years ago is that the literacy rate for, for Braille uh, has significantly declined over, over the years. Back in the 60s, it was about half of the, the blind, and now it's below 10%. Uh, so what, what does one do to help the blind uh, interact with their environments more? And of course, technologies is one option. Uh, invasive approaches is another. Um, but let's stick with technologies for the time being. And one technology that you may have heard about uh, is sensory substitution. And uh, a friend and colleague of mine, and, and uh, Olivier's as well, Amir Mehdi, has developed an algorithm called iMusic that transforms an image into a soundscape, basically uh, translating position vertically into pitch uh, and position horizontally into time as one rasters across the screen. And people can learn how to do this. The blind can learn how to do this. And you can drive visual cortices to respond to these soundscapes in a functionally selective manner. Now, this is great. And the last time I was in Rovereto uh, was during one of the chaos meetings. Not this last one, but the year before. And there was a nice uh, discussion over a very fine Rovereto meal, uh, which you can never fail as a wonderful experience, about are they actually seeing? or are they mentally imagining? We can't know for certain from these data. We don't know the qualia of the visual perceptions that, that these individuals have. So what we did is to use electrophysiology and the timing uh, it affords to have a better sense of what might be the qualia of, of their experiences. So we had nine uh, essentially congenitally blind individuals, uh, one of whom became blind about a year uh, of age, and we trained them up with the voice, which is very similar to iMusic, to differentiate faces from non-faces uh, or scrambled faces. Let's see if the sounds work. They did on the train. <clears throat> um, I apologize. If you want to know what they sound like, come and find me after the talk. Um, but we looked at responses to faces and scrambled faces delivered by these soundscapes. What we observed is that starting around uh, 480 milliseconds or so, brain responses to these soundscapes differ between those 
conferring facial information and those conferring scrambled versions of those faces. And these effects were due to changes again in the topography of the event-related potential of the scalp, which means different generators, which we could localize to a combination of these voice-specific regions and what looks like face-selective regions. So this is very, very fresh data. In fact, uh, I analyzed these data on the train here. So you can actually analyze data on the train. Uh, if, if you've never traveled from Lausanne to here, it's, it's an absolutely beautiful train ride. And I encourage you to do it. It's a great way to work as well. So that's one, one approach for sensory substitution. Another that I unfortunately don't have any data on because we've literally signed contracts today with the company uh, is to, sorry, and again, I'm biased by art and neuroscience. If you're a blind individual and you want to go to the Mart, how would you look at a painting? Um, you can have an audio aid, but it doesn't give you an impression for uh, the composition of the painting. And a blind individual might not know if they're looking at a painting versus a blank wall. But suppose you gave that blind individual a tablet. And this tablet, unlike most tablets, isn't just smooth when you put your hand over it, but actually gives you haptic feedback. In fact, gives you a haptic relief of whatever image you want to present at any instant in time. So this could be a painting. It could be text. You no longer need to print things in Braille. You can print things in text that people know. So we have this technology. We've developed this technology with some partners. We're now testing to see exactly the brain mechanisms involved. Uh, so we want to compare this in particular to other auditory aids to see which features and which functions can be combined, uh, as well as understand how you can use different sensory modalities to help specific functions like navigation, mental rotation, uh, object recognition, object invariance, and so on and so forth. So I'll come back in another bit of time and tell you more about that. So what about recognition memory? So uh, again, for those Americans in the room, you'll understand the joke. For those that don't, just ignore it and don't worry. A guy walks into a bar and has a few experiences. Uh, so he notices one woman who doesn't say much. And I apologize in advance. I am wearing orange. I'm against violence against women. This is a free image that I got. It's not meant to be sexist in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> Then there was another woman, but it's paired with an incongruent sound. In fact, a man's voice. Another woman who just has her phone beeping all the time. And finally, a, a fourth woman who has a semantically congruent auditory experience together with uh, her, her visual expression. And unbeknownst to this poor man in the bar, one of them has picked his pocket. And he later has to figure out who it is. Who would he remember best from these four experiences? if he had to do a lineup. And again, this is a caricature just to get you to understand the basic concept. Or if you go to a conference and meet somebody, who will you remember best? Those people with whom you've had a multi-sensory experience or those individuals where it was only auditory or only visual? So we asked this, uh, not lining up women uh, in a police room, but instead using a, a continuous recognition task that required people to tell us for every single item, is it being presented for the first time or for a repeated time? And unbeknownst to the participants, sometimes there would be an extra sensory modality. It could be visual, it could be auditory, it could be tactile. And so there were two types of repeated images in this case, images that had been presented with sounds and images that had been presented just visually. And these were only single trial exposures to these multisensory contexts. And what we found across many experiments now and across modalities is that those images or those sounds that had been paired with a semantically congruent event are better remembered than those images or sounds that had not. And those that had been presented with a semantically incongruent or even meaningless event are remembered worse. So it seems that the context in which you learn things can very strongly influence your ability to remember those things. And you can actually get a benefit from multisensory context. So change of context can be beneficial. And we, of course, looked at the electrophysiology of this. And what we find is that incoming visual information is differentially processed according to how you previously experienced it just one trial, single trial. And it could be many, many trials ago, starting already at 60 milliseconds. So really, the very initial volley of activity within the cortex differentiates between those images that had been just visual, 
and those images that had been multisensory, even though the multisensory context is completely task irrelevant. And in fact, the participants didn't even report being aware of the multisensory context. They were doing the visual task, which was quite challenging. We did the same thing in the auditory modality and saw effects, if you will, even earlier in time, but later in terms of the temporal hierarchy of processing in the auditory system is much faster. But here, the latencies were earlier, about 35 milliseconds. Same type of effects. Enhanced responses within auditory cortices for sounds that had been presented with semantically congruent images. So what about the lifespan? Well, we can again go into the bar and look at the, the man that goes into the bar, but what about the bartender? Who would be the better witness for who pickpocketed the poor guy? So we took our paradigm and we asked, are there predictors of who will show a memory benefit and who will show a memory impairment based on these single trial multisensory contexts? So we found that there were some people that benefited, some people that didn't. And we asked, is there something about how they encode the information? So there are multisensory trials and unisensory trials. Are their brains responding differently in response to multisensory stimuli? And those individuals who would show a memory benefit showed stronger multisensory responses than those individuals who wouldn't. In this case, starting at about 270 milliseconds within inferior parietal cortices. There was no difference or no reliable difference in their unisensory processing. So it's not that these individuals who do benefit are special. They're special in how they process multisensory information. We did the same experiment on a different set of individuals doing the auditory task. And again, saw some people get better and some people get worse. And those individuals who get better show enhanced multisensory processing again. And again, within the inferior parietal cortices. But again, no difference in unisensory processing. So there seems to be something special about how people process multisensory information at encoding that will determine <clears throat> whether or not they'll show memory benefit at recognition. And what about kids? This was my daughter a few years ago when she was first learning how to read, which uh, anybody that has children will think it's awfully cute. Anybody that doesn't have children will think it's awfully annoying. How do you teach a child to read? Uh, and how do you get them to take if you will, an arbitrary pairing of a sound and visual stimulus and put it together and know what it means. So we didn't quite look at reading. Instead, we took the same tasks that I've been presenting you all along, meaning a simple detection task and this recognition memory task. And we asked, is there a, a, a link, a correlational link between benefits in simple multisensory binding as measured by this reaction time facilitation, and memory enhancement on this memory task. What we found, and these again are, are quite preliminary data, but from a, a group of, of young children, is that the extent to which a child shows facilitation of multisensory detection is correlated with the extent to which that child will show benefit on their memory for visual stimuli that had been initially presented in a multisensory context. So the more they'll take advantage of these multisensory contexts in their environment. And what about the other end of the spectrum? If you take older individuals, what we found there on this detection task is that there are some individuals who are visual dominant and auditory dominant, but this didn't differ across uh, age groups or even in individuals who are older and have mild cognitive impairment. What does differ is the extent to which that facilitation exceeds what you would predict based on probability summation alone, such that older individuals show greater um, violation of this race model inequality. So if you have more nonlinear enhancement of their behavior. And in particular, uh, if you're an auditory dominant individual. The more interesting thing, I think, and again, these are very preliminary data, is that the extent to which one's reaction time is facilitated seems again to be correlated with people's memory performance, here measured on the mini-mental state exam, such that individuals with a higher uh, facilitation of their reaction times score better on the MMSE, even though they're all qualified as being mild cogn mildly cognitively impaired. 
So this might be another way to, to probe the integrity of memory processes using a much more simple paradigm that is perhaps more accessible to a larger number of patients. The other domain that I think is quite promising uh, in terms of sensory processing, but also multi-sensory processing, is how this develops and how necessary uh, the sensory environment at birth is for the proper development of sensory systems. So premature kids are, are born, about half a million are born per year and survive. And that number is increasing because medical technology is increasing. On the other hand, we're just beginning to get a sense for the consequences of prematurity on brain development. And what we've done in this case, uh, this isn't at all multisensory, but instead simply tactile. What we did is we looked at about 60, uh, sorry, 55 full-term kids, 61 preterm kids in the NICU during the first days post-birth, uh, or the equivalent in the case of the premature kids. And what we found is that responses, what we first did was use a normative approach in the full-term kids to identify what is somatosensory processing looking like in a full-term baby. We then used this to um, classify brain responses from premature kids. What we find in premature babies is that the response to touch is severely impaired. But their response to the sham stimulus is, of course, not. The more interesting thing is that even if you control for the extent of prematurity, the number of positive experiences in their life in the NICU will facilitate a normalization of their response to touch. Whereas the number of negative experiences in the NICU, such as heel lances to, to take blood, tube insertions, again, all medically necessary procedures, so we're not going out and hurting the kids on purpose, but the number of those will impair their somatosensory development. The implication of that is we need to be very mindful of the type of environment that these premature kids are going through, but we can now do this quantitatively and even generate predictive models of outcome two years later based on these data recorded in the NICU at the time of birth. So I've given you an awful lot of data. Let's see if you can take home a few key messages. So the first thing I would hopefully uh, have conveyed is that we need a new schema for brain organization. The primary cortices are wired together, and they indeed send conversion and integrative information between them. This is behaviorally relevant. You can change perception, and you can change uh, performance efficacy based on these integrative processes in low-level cortices. What we don't know yet is how this develops and changes across the lifespan mechanistically. We can also change the excitability of at least visual cortex using non-visual information. The extent to which we can apply this to sensory impaired individuals or to individuals that are learning specific stimuli remains to be determined. We can also see quite clearly that sensory substitution is a viable technique, a non-invasive and cheap technique to deliver visual qualia to visually impaired individuals. We don't know yet what, what that qualia really is, um, but we do know that it works. We also know that we can improve memory based on multisensory information. Now, how can we exploit that to help children learn better? How can we exploit that to help people uh, who are aging with memory impairments to have preserved function? We don't know yet. And what we are quite excited about is linking up very low-level multisensory functions with very high-level cognitive operations. What those links are mechanistically, we're not sure yet. We have some ideas. But I think this is a quite exciting domain that, that will uh, come to the forefront over the next years. So with that, I'll, I'll thank you for your attention and happily take any questions you might have.
thank you so much. It was really brilliant. I have a question related to your um, findings related to the inferior parietal areas that seem to play a key role in integration of multisensory information, which comes a little bit out of the blue in your talk in that you were highlighting direct connection in between uh, sensory areas. So what uh, have you been characterizing the responses in that particular region and what do you think it happens there? Right. Um, we were surprised a bit uh, to one, uh, in one extent. Uh, bear in mind these effects in parietal cortices, at least in that paradigm, are uh, happening during the encoding. Uh, and usually what we're looking at is sensory processing uh, when we're seeing these primary cortices involved. That said, the involvement of parietal cortices is not surprising uh, at all. Uh, Uta Nopanai has shown this quite nicely in terms of uh, its involvement in uh, perceptual outcome in terms of uh, memory performance as well. So the localization wasn't surprising to us. The timing is a bit surprising. It's a bit late. For, my, I mean, for me, I'm, I'm somebody who loves super early things. But again, it may be a consequence of the task itself. People didn't have to pay any attention to the multisensory. In fact, we're discouraged from. Uh, so that may influence the timing of these effects. Um, it's also a single trial. If people went through a study paradigm where they had to form these associations, I, a strong prediction would be that these effects would move lower in the hierarchy. Now, that's a prediction that requires empirical data. Um, we're working on that. We're also working to see how long these effects last, because uh, so far we've done it within a session. And that could be up to a couple minutes, but that doesn't really help anybody in real life. Uh, so now we're looking over time, uh, as well as the influence of sleep quality. Uh, but again, these are all things in progress. Yeah, yeah. Great profit. Um, you were also, if I understood you correctly, with the elderly people showing a correlation between the facilitation of the congruency, yeah. well, of the multisensory but congruent trials, I guess, mm -hmm. versus unisensory. Now here, uh, these data are just a simple detection task. So it's a flash of light, so literally a circle, <laughs> and a, a pure tone. Oh, I see. It so was just not the image with the sound. It which wasn't is the, either the memory task. We're okay. doing that now in elderly, mild cognitive impairment, Parkinson's, um, MS. Uh, we're collecting the data. That's the nice thing of being at a hospital. Patient okay. Access. Thanks. I'll jump on this, quest, this, this, this question. Um, so the way I used to think why all the people might be better integrators was based on the uh, inverse effectiveness principle. Yeah. So basically that the fact that the reliability of unisensory signals is lower yeah. because they hear less well, they see less well. So basically they have more room yeah. for a beneficial effect of yeah. multisensory integration, which is a classical phenomenon as you. Yeah. So the point is that it's difficult to relate. So first, do you see that in your data, that basically, that like, they are, they are basically processing less well these simple flash and yeah. simple sounds, and maybe that can be explained? And if it is the case, so how do we relate that? Or people that have less um, reliable unisensor information are better in yeah. eye level cognition? Yeah. Um, right. Uh, it might be a long winded answer, so bear with me. Um, we've, in most of our experiments, we use, we deliberately use super threshold stimuli. So blast the system, if you will. So these checkerboard stimuli are very super threshold. It's probably not a proper term, but it's hard to imagine an unreliable response to a checkerboard. Uh, same thing with a loud, pure tone. Um, that said, we do see inter-individual variability. But it's hard to, to have a quantitative measure of response reliability from behavior. What we are looking at, uh, and what I didn't present today uh, either, are the techniques we're developing 
for single trial EEG classification, which allow us to, uh, much like MVPA for the MR gurus in the room, wherever Marius is, uh, you can take single trial EEG data and classify it based on its topographic distribution. And what we can do with that is have a model of what reliable looks like and unreliable looks like. And we're doing that successfully. We don't know yet how that's linked to behavioral outcome yet. Uh, we do have some data to indicate that um, individuals with a broader spread of their reaction time distribution show different circuits for multisensory integration than those individuals with a more narrow distribution. Uh, again, what causes that, we don't know. It doesn't seem to be the case that any individual will be always unreliable or always reliable. There are fluctuations, and that's probably linked to a lot of the things that uh, I know that you're interested in, but I also know that Carlo is interested in, in terms of what is the brain state at the time of stimulus delivery and how that determines, if you will, reliability of information processing. So if you give the stimulus at the right phase of brain activity, you'll actually get a better performance. Now, that said, in our data, um, we haven't seen any pre-stimulus dependencies on our behavioral outcome. Now, I don't know why that is. Um, Charlie Schroeder and I are trying to look at that a bit more. Uh, sorry for, this is perhaps internal. Uh, people, Charlie Schroeder is a big proponent of uh, phase resetting as a mechanism for multisensory integration and uh, was also my thesis supervisor many decades ago. Um, we're, we're trying to look at that. Now, another interesting thing to make it even more complicated, we've done psychophysics in the monkey and they do seem to follow very tightly inverse effectiveness. What we, we did the same experiments in human beings and we can't replicate what we see in the monkey in the human. And I don't know why. Um, it seems that humans don't reliably follow a simple inverse effectiveness principle. And the looming data, to me, are the strongest evidence for that. So bear with me and I'll go back. And then you can attack me some more, which is what I'm here for. Um, so in the looming case, if you take a simple view of, of, of what um, inverse effectiveness would predict, a looming stimulus is actually uh, minimally effective at first and getting more and more effective because it's getting bigger or louder. But compare that to something that is big to begin with and getting smaller or big and stays big or small and stays small. The, the biggest gain should be with the tiny little stimuli. And that's not what we see in humans, at least in our hands. Um, and that's not what what Chris Kaiser has seen when he did the same stuff with looming in the monkey. So it may be that inverse effectiveness works very well, and this relates to the thesis for tomorrow, to single unit recordings and spiking activity. It may not correspond very well in all circumstances to all types of stimuli in population responses. And there again is a huge domain that I know you're interested in and Stefani is interested in of how do we translate principles established from single unit recordings to um, population level responses. And it's super tricky. And I, I, I wish I had a good answer, but I don't yet. I don't know if that resolves your question or not. But. We didn't look at shadows. <laughs> so thank you very much. This is, was great. Uh, so. In the multisensory literature now, there are many, um, uh, many studies that show the benefit of uh, having a multisensory stimulation. And uh, one side of your work that I really, really uh, appreciate in, in recent years is the fact that you showed that it's not just a benefit for the here and now, it's also a benefit for potentially the future. So yeah. you, you have an experience, a multisensory experience, and this will change also your memory, your learning, and so on. Um, now, it's a bit of an awkward question, actually. But 
do you think there is also a dark side of multisensory integration? What I mean is, uh, if you talk about multisensory integration in rehabilitation context, mm. uh, often uh, you hear people thinking that the more the merrier. So when, uh, whatever, multisensory is good. Yeah. And, and so I got to think that actually it isn't. Uh, illusions that we use to study multisensory integration yeah. often show exactly that it's not necessarily good. It actually can lead you to wrong percepts. Yeah. Uh, but I want to hear your opinion about uh, this balance between using multisensory integration in a proactive yeah. fashion and actually the dark side of multisensory integration. Okay. Uh, again, it's, it's, it's a great uh, topic for a good debate. <laughs> um, I think in rehabilitation you have to get the brain ready for um, dealing with multisensory stimuli again. So in the case, let's say, of stroke, uh, there are other issues that the patient has to deal with before they can deal with reintegrating multisensory information. Their attentional capacities are changed, usually, let's say, neglect or extinction. Um, their spatial representations are completely wacky. It's probably not a politically correct term, but... Um, and so there is a dark side. Or you can take the other extreme of uh, cochlear implant users. So uh, deaf individuals will, of course, use visual information to, uh, well, you know this actually extremely well, um, to help them hear better. They then get a cochlear implant and they have to undo all of that multisensory processing to no longer rely on vision and instead rely on audition. And that's hard to undo. And that might, uh, that might make it harder for a cochlear implant user to use their cochlear implant properly and make the, um, rehabilitation isn't the word, but the um, a customization. I don't know if that's a, even an English word. Uh, getting up to proper thresholds with the use of their cochlear implant longer and might protract it. Uh, same thing in, sub, in visual sensory substitution. How do you best prepare that individual to, to use integration in the right way? Um, in the case of the memory stuff, what I didn't emphasize is actually at the time of the initial presentation, the multisensory stimuli there lead to impaired performance in terms of reaction time. Now, you could say that's normal because you're giving people information in a modality that they're not doing the task in. Um, but it's interesting because typically when you just throw sensory stimulation at people, they do better. And if you take um, some of the work by, by John Fox and Sophie Molholm on object recognition in multisensory context, it should get better. And in fact, it doesn't, it gets worse. But later on, it helps. Um, so there is a dark side. I should first agree with you. And I, I think we have a very opaque view of the dark side. Uh, because we're usually not looking for it. Uh, but it, it is there. It is, I think, making it harder for patients to rehabilitate if they're not prepared properly. And so we have to think very carefully about the neurorehabilitation strategies. Uh, actually, this came up, I was two weeks ago in San Torso, which you were at the year before, at the neurocognitive, I, I, it's, uh, sorry, this is a complete tangent, bear with me. It's the first time in my life I was simultaneously translated so it was all in a time, well, you had no problem, but for me, uh, I gave a similar talk, and after every slide, I had to stop and let the person translate. It was so frustrating. Um, but there, we got into a discussion of, is multisensory processing, again, always at the benefit of the patient? And it, it, I would argue very strongly it's not. And we should be very, very mindful. Um, but I don't know, I don't, think we have enough data yet to know on what circumstances it is and is, uh, but I think you raise an important point. Um, in kids, I think it's equally important. And again, there we just don't have enough data yet. Uh, I think, yeah, uh, I don't think I should say more, but uh, I, I think it's a very delicate thing and we have to be very careful uh, about how we, how we sell multisensory processing as a, as a good thing. <laughs>
I don't know if that answered you properly. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You can ask questions in Italian. I'll try and translate. Or French. So maybe what we can do is like ask these questions in the bar because there is like this proposition like that feel like actually I think it's a, a bottom of proposition from the student that they propose that maybe we could meet the speaker in a more informal setting. Yeah, I, I can take off my tie, don't worry. So <laughs> <laughs> maybe that would be a great moment to ask some question. And so we will all go after the talk right now actually in Stapomato and so there, you can have a good, yeah, have a true multisensory experience there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again. It's a pleasure.